As Monty Python would say, and now for something completely different. So when I was invited, uh, and I was like, uh, well, what do I do? And uh, I mean, it's always tough to talk to a community of very high level uh, data producers, which I can put it this way, and data analysts. And I wonder if you ever think what happens to your data. So let me tell you a little bit about it. So the background is, of course, uh, Brazil. And the question here is, can Brazil achieve uh, zero deforestation in Amazonia? And this is, uh, is now, this year, Brazil is the head of the G20. And uh, Lula has announced, as you see here, uh, as one of the major announcements to be made at the G20 ministerial, which will happen later this year, is that by 2030, zero deforestation in Brazil. And of course, uh, Brazil is well known, I don't have to tell you, I'm not going to do a description of the information systems uh, that we have. I suppose that you know we have them, and uh, some of you know them de in detail. But my point here is uh, we are very much information-driven. But information-driven, of course, uh, thanks to satellites like Sentinel and thanks to open source software and so on. Uh, but of course, what happens to the information. So information, per se, le leads you nowhere unless you know what to do with it. So one of the key issues here in terms of Brazil is the fact that there is a clear plan, and of course this is in Portuguese, but uh, the translation is action plan for prevention and control of deforestation and legal Amazonia. That's the next phase which run from last year until 2027. So this is a plan, and I can tell you if you, I think there's an in English translation, I'm not so sure, but it's heavily driven on information. But of course, it's not like, oh, we give the information and you have to do it. It's a little bit more complicated. Life, real life, outside academia is a little bit more complicated. There's a nice book by someone who's maligned, Francis Fukuyama, the guy who wrote The End of History and The Last Man. But of course, uh, his book, he has two books uh, called The Origins of Political Order. And it's a very nice book about how do you get to Denmark? Is there anyone from Denmark here? No one. I mean, Denmark, not being Denmark, capital Copenhagen, but that mythical place where everybody is happy, everybody is nice, everybody is nice to each other, all the government works, like, you know, if you've seen the Borgen, the, the series, uh, you may have an idea about it. Okay, but what does Fukuyama say? Fukuyama says that a modern democracy has three foundations. The first is the state. The state needs to work. If you have a dysfunctional state, in other words, the institutions do not work, there's no democracy. And of course, if there is people who are intent to destroy the current state, they are a threat to democracy. And I don't have to tell you because you have many examples at your fingertips. The other balance point of democracy is the rule of law. If you have a now powerful, state, and you can think of some, without the rule of law, without the citizens being protected, without the contracts being enforced, you don't have democracy, you have an autocracy or dictatorship. But of course, the third point is whether there is public accountability. And of course, the, the, the traditional accountability, we say votes, but there are many places where there's votes, there's a good... Uh, political uh, scientist who says, democracy was there's an election and the opposition wins and takes power. Okay, so the fact that the EU exists, democracy in terms of votes does not translate necessarily. Some people are saying, vote for me now because you don't have to vote any longer. And uh, you can imagine who said that, but that was actually that, that fact that someone would come and say, vote for me, and you don't have to vote any longer, shows how much our democracy are under threat. So how does this play out in Brazil, and specifically 
for the protection of the Amazon. It plays out clearly, and let's look a little bit on the facts, the, what happened in Brazil between 2004 and 2019, 15 years. Okay, in 2004, deforestation was 27,000 square kilometers, 1,000 square kilometers, multiply by 100, you get hectares. And then you had anti-corruption operations. You had a moratorium on, on soy on deforested areas. You had a focus on critical areas and action by the police and the federal police and environmental agency. You had a credit crunch. If you were living on, and it was really tough. It's, it's a case, a biblical case. Uh, you know the story that uh, uh, Crusader was getting to a city and uh, the guy said, the king was saying, okay, but there's, uh, there's some, uh, our enemies, and there, but there are also uh, people who believe in us. And then, of course, what the guy says is, that kill them all, the God will select them, who are the ones that deserve to go to heaven. So this was a credit crunch. In other words, municipalities who had high deforestation, there was no credit. It doesn't matter if you deforest that you didn't deforest. There was simply no credit. That's the crusader goal. There was a ranchers agreement. And then in 2013, and I happened to, <laughs> for, for accident or coincidence, I happened to be the director of INPI from 2005 to 2012. Uh, no prizes for guessing. Deforestation went down by 80%. Of course, I'm very proud, but it was, of course, not my fault. But in any way, it was there. And then in 2013, uh, the elected president, Rousseff, was impeached. We get Bolsonaro, and guess what? Amnesty, reduction in protection areas, regularization is postponed. Bolsonaro attacks environment agencies. Government promotes uh, mining in, uh, in, in, in native areas. And guess what? Deforestation goes down. So that's the state. In other words, the state has the power to bring deforestation down and to bring deforestation up, no matter what the satellites say. And Brazil is fortunate because it's the only, only, only country on Earth which has a complete open policy regarding geospatial data. It's the only place on Earth. Even the United States is not so open. There is a decree that says sharing and dissemination of geospatial data and its metadata is mandatory for all federal executive agencies, including census, including property data, including the tax number of the owner of a property. In Germany, you don't have that. When I taught in Germany in 2013 from 2015, I could not get hands of a German census. Uh, I used to have, I had to teach German students with Brazilian data because we could not get access to Germany data. And I, I suppose Austria is similar because I know most of Europe is, is, is similar. And what does the state have? The state is, in modern democracies, has the right to the legitimate use of force, including the following. You see someone, you see a fire. What is this fire? The fire is the following. If an agent, law enforcement agent in the Amazon, finds a big of those big trucks, you know, destroying trees. Some, when they started, the whole 2004, 2005, it really started putting deforestation down. Uh, what happened was, uh, what do you do when you confiscate these trucks, big and enormous? There's a, there is no even place to hold them. So the judge said, oh, uh, give them to the owner, in custody. So, okay, it's like giving the criminal back his gun after he's killed your father, right? So, after a lot of pressure, what does the state does now? Burn. If you get your normal truck in the Amazon and uh, you get caught by law enforcement agency, your truck is burned to the ground, as you see here. It's called legitimate use of force. It would not happen in the United States, by the way. I doubt it happened in other country. It happens because there is an enormous pressure on a society. And of course, the state has the legitimate use of 
force in the back sense. My successor in EP was fired. You may remember the story. This is the New York Times fighting the agency, the head of EMPI, because he wanted the data to be cooked. And my successor said, no, 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 I'm not cooking any data. And he was fired. It was good that he was fired because his firing protected us. We continued to, to, pu to push the data, and the data was not cooked anyway. Now, what is the balance of force? So if you think about what you do in the information, you have to think of the balance of forces. And that's the last election, 2022 election. Red is Lula, blue is Bolsonaro. Now, what is the correlation between the most important soy and cattle producing areas in Brazil and the votes for Bolsonaro? Any guesses from zero to 100? <laughs> Almost 100. So all the areas in blue are the areas with most deforestation and are the areas where people vote for Bolsonaro, which means that the federal state is alone when doing enforcement. The municipalities, the governors, they are in favor of deforestation. So it's even a clash between the federal police and the local police because the local police is helping the guys. So it's, it's tough. I mean, one thing is sitting in Washington with Jeff Bezos, $100 million to do what you want. The other thing is really doing things. And of course, having a Congress against you puts you in pressure. And this is last year. Majority of Congress is pushing laws to restrict the rights of indigenous population. The fight is going on. It's not finished. It's on the Supreme Court right now. And there's a chance the indigenous would lose. And this is some years ago. I was a director at the time, but it could be now. This is a very powerful guy. This guy happens to be the world's largest soybean producer called Blago Maggi. At that time, he was governor of the most soybean producing state in Brazil, Mato Grosso. And in Portuguese, but I suppose some of you can interpolate, it says, queremos saber a serviço de quem o INPE está mentindo. In Portuguese, it sounds nicer than in English. We want to know to whom, INPE, on behalf of whom INPE is lying. So he's accusing me, the director at that time, uh, uh, to say, OK, you're lying on behalf of the American sector because the American soybean producers uh, are benefiting from the fact that we're not able to expand into this fantastic Amazonian land. But because Brazil was governed by Lula, we had a meeting with Lula in the cabinet, and Lula was, got fed up with it. OK, guy, why, he looks at me and says, OK, prove that you're right. I said, OK, Mr. President, let's fly a helicopter. So OK, so we chose a place in Brazil. We developed a flight plan. Based on the data which was public, we say, OK, we're going to use data which is in public, and we're going to tell the pilot, the helicopter pilot, to fly over these places. OK? And we're going to invite, obviously, Mr. Maggi, the government of Mato Grosso. And here's Mr. Maggi facing science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, science. <laughs> and you may know someone <laughs> down there back there explaining to me to Maggi, uh, oh, Mr. Maggi, this is the first station. And the second here is, of course, the great Marina Silva, the Minister for the Environment, the lady from the jungle who is, you know, if there's no heaven in this world, but if there would be a heaven, she would be there. But so what is the lesson? Transparency builds governance. And what's the problem with the UDR and all the things? The only country in the world which is fully transparent on its environmental data is Brazil. The only country in the world which is fully transparent on environmental data is Brazil. Repeat that 20 times, and you understand how stupid this situation is. Why are the other countries not transparent and have not less learned the lesson of transparency? I don't know. Maybe they didn't have a crazy Ingi director. Who knows? And by the way, Ingi. The Landsat, and uh, uh, Tom was right on his money, Landsat was not released in 2011, but 2008. And, but before that, there was an editorial in Nature who had said exactly this. Brazil has set an important precedent by making its Earth observation data available, yes, 
and the rest of the world should follow suit. It's no accident that I became general secretary director because I was telling the guys, and then it was a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock when Bob Ryan, who became director of the general secretary later, calls me and said, Gilberto, I finally convinced U.S. just to release the data. Oh, Bob, fantastic. And how did you do it? Oh, my argument was simple. If Brazil can do it, U.S. can do it too. Okay, so now, rule of law. What do you do with the rule of law? What can you use information for the rule of law? One of the clear applications of the rule of law is the enforcement of the law as regards deforestation. And Brazil is unique, again, in most world countries, and not unique, but I think very few, if I remember uh, in the survey, in which if you have a private property which you own by all legal rights, and if that property is in the Amazon, you cannot do what you want with it. You have to preserve 80% of it. Now, if you, what happens if you don't do it? First enough, how do you know the, the, the area is not preserved? Question number one. So to answer this question, you need an information system which basically goes to each property and assigns how much deforestation there is in each property. And to my friends on Global Forest Watch, what is the accuracy you need to assign this? EUDR, what is the accuracy? Who has this accuracy to be able to go for UDR? Because that's the only way you're going to enforce UDI. UDI is new, the forest code is on the time, but essentially it's the compliance and personal responsibility who has to be in place. And then, of course, Congress is fighting back, saying, no, 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 these poor guys, you know, they're just so poor, they only export so many soil, and they have used the land for productive purposes, and there's a fight going on. But based on this data, you can assert, for example, how much deforestation is legal and illegal. Legal according to the law. Legal, legal, legal according to the forest code. And you can see that most of deforestation, 85% of it, is illegal. So that's why a state, organized state, the reason why an organized state could fight deforestation and the chances of Brazil getting zero deforestation, they are contingent on the fact that Brazil can enforce the law. So you need the rule of law, you need the state to enforce the law, and you need accountability, both internal and external, remember the triangle, to make the law enforcement. And you still have 10%, 15% of legal. So how do you get to zero? You first have to have an enormous state organized, which, and you don't want Congress to block in it, and you still have to promote reforestation. But you get interesting things, for example. Uh, it's funny thing that this is our data. This is a paper I published in 2023. A deforestation follows a power law. In other words, the famous power law, 5%. 1% of the properties are responsible for 75% of deforestation consistently over the years. That's the famous power law, Pareto's law, if you want it. And of course, we know what they are. So in, for example, 2022, 1% of the properties had 82.5% of the cuts. This, again, is the power of information helping the country, because if you know that 1% of the property has 80% of the cuts, you don't have to put one uh, guard from Environmental Protection Agency in each place in the Amazon, but you can focus on where the action is, the bad action. And of course, you remember that 15%. That 15% is crucial because it also has to do with the pledges Brazil made to the Paris Agreement of restoring 12 million hectares. And then the question is, how do you store and who pays for it? So, the, of course, the economists behind you 
I don't know if there's any economists here, but he would ask, what are the opportunity costs? In other words, how much does it cost for the restoration? And this is again from the paper I was the first author. Basically here, herbaceous pasture is a good way to saying large cattle. Let's fix on the third. Uh, these are farms with more than 1,000 hectares. 1,000 hectares, 1,000 football fields, just, okay. These farms, large cattle farms, uh, have about 11 million hectares in Amazonia. Half of them, well, 4.5, that's the number, 4 point whatever, are illegal. Illegal in the sense of being against. And either you force them to restore, or you pay them to restore. Or you don't do anything, you do, and, and you don't restore anything. But it, here you see the extent of the challenge of, of filling the bond challenge and the 12 million hectares. You either need German money or Swiss money or Norway money to pay these guys, and then, and then of course, crime pays, huh? right? I think uh, the history of humanity, crime always pays. But, uh, and then you, or you don't. Or you go to soybeans. Soybeans in numbers, they are so people say, oh, soybeans in the Amazon, now your director uh, said the other day, the soybeans, in fact, it's the, it's the cattle, it's not the soybeans, but still, uh, soybeans in Amazon are something, uh, big soybean farms are about 2.7 million hectares, so it's much less than the cattle. The cattle is the problem. And the problem with the cattle is, if you may restore the area, where does the cattle go? Does it go to the sky? Uh, but again, this is the use of information system combined with satellite, very high, good resolution satellite data, very accurate, and access to information about each and every farm. And you not, cannot do it otherwise. And you can only drive action if you have that. Now, things have gotten worse with Bolsonaro. Because at least in the case of the forest code, we have the tax numbers. You have the names and the numbers of the farmers. The worst has happened recently, and Bolsonaro was actively involved in it, and his, his gang was actively involved in it, is organized crime. So it's organized crime goes against the easy money. The easy money is not cattle. The easy money is gold. And this is Madeira Riva. These are all illegal draining, putting mercury on the river to get gold. And guess what? This is a paper my student did for PhD. It's on environmental research letters. People have asked permits to mine in indigenous lands. Okay? So this is a, as a proportion of an indigenous ethnic how much has been requested of mining and what is the mining purpose? Yellow, no prices for gassing, it's gold. So in the Kayapos, for example, it's close to 50% of uh, the area has been requested for gold mining. And all of this, of course, is illegal. And <laughs> no prices for gassing, that someone is buying this. 90% of European gold imports from Brazil are exposed to a high risk of illegality. Maybe it's time for Europe to start a EU gold regulation. Right? So you all not only have to fight Congress, Black Magi, the bad farmers, you have to fight organized crime. Don't think life is easy. So what is Brazil trying to do? Brazil hopes to do fight new deforestation, enforce the forest code, promote supply chain arrangements, for example, responsible soy, responsible cattle, push a strong deterrence of illegal mining, and improve the monitoring tools. Because as I, as I try to convince you, the law enforcement center in Brazil is very much information oriented and based on the best possible information, which by no by, by accident, it says that, but it doesn't end there. UDR. Why do you think UDR has been, has been delayed for one year? Mark, 
my guess, and I'm willing to put my hand on the fire, is that JRC doesn't have a system which is credible enough to provide the information needed by UDR. In no accident. It takes a huge amount of money. So these guys are now profiting from the ignorance and from the this mismatch between decision that was taken by the Commission and the technical capabilities developed by JRC saying, oh, JRC's data is no good. Even Brazil, even Brazil, that uses the same deforestation as UDR and has fantastic monitoring tools, thank you very much. National data is not necessarily compliant. The produce deforestation monitoring systems offer only 6.5. Detail why UDR requires 0.5. Well, sir, no. The current produce data is 0.5, and because of the support, well, back to one point. This is what came on the Guardian today. Okay, this is today's Guardian. The EU chief is complaining about deforestation being uh, uh, postponed for one year. And like I said, I'm putting my hand on the fire. JRC doesn't have the system ready. And JRC is not willing to cooperate. If would be willing to cooperate, it would say, well, what's, it's very nice. Ingis talks about tools, Tom talks about tools, uh, Wolfgang talks about tools, but who has the system in place that works? We do. We get 95% of accuracy on an open source machine learning based system, which is all available to everyone and has the support of my dear friend Tom Hengel in the parts of the project. So, to end up the story, what are the risks? Lula loses the presidential election. Trump wins in the United States. Congress enacts deforestation friendly laws. Big oil interest and big agro prevail. That's the national. But there's international win. A botched implementation of EUDR will do a lot of damage. Europe has to be careful and to be careful of what it wishes. You need to implement UDR correctly. He, when they started the negotiations, the Europeans said, we're going to use JRC's data, not produce. And Brazil jumped like this, show me JRC's data. There's no such data. It's not available. Failure to provide support, fatum color credits. You know the story about Vera. And of course, friendly fire. I don't think Global Forest Watch did that on purpose. It's just that they need, they need to show something for business money. And they don't care if imp is burnt in the process. But in the end, the whole story is truth matters. Do you know this place? Who has been there? My final guess. Who has tied the knot there? 40 years. 43, actually, marriage. It worked for me. I don't know for the others. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>